It's the week ending Saturday the 14th of December and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days, we've seen voters taking to the polling booths in the UK general election, Greta Thunberg announced as Time magazine's Person of the Year, and the death of rock set singer Marie Fredrickson, age 61. But we're here to bring you some stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, and let's unwrap the week. And joining me today from the week's digital team, we welcome James Ashford from The Week Junior, Felicity Capon, and from Money Week, we've got a sweepstakes on whether he can make it through the show without mentioning the 2008 financial crisis. It's John Stepek. And John, you are starting the show this week. What do you think this week will be remembered for? This is the week that Saudi Arabia called time on the oil era. To be fair to them, it's TBD. It's possible they'll get to that $2 trillion mark over time. I mean, this, this is a stock that should be trading for many years to come. Um, The thing is, though, that Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, who was the person that uh, unveiled the plans to take this deal public uh, in 2016 as part of his vision for modernizing and diversifying the country, really had his heart set on a true $2 trillion valuation or even three. And if you look at that document, he said two to three. Kate Kelly, Wall Street correspondent for The New York Times, speaking on CNBC. John, what's she talking about? So basically this week, Saudi Arabia sold off a chunk of its massive state-owned oil company, Saudi Aramco, on the public markets. What Saudi wants to do is is selling its family jewels, if you like, in order to diversify its economy. But what was significant is it's the biggest initial public offering, or IPO, of a company ever. It raised about $25 billion in the process. So how can it be the biggest when the news coverage I saw said it was also the smallest in terms of like what the shares that they offered up for the public to buy? It was like 1% or yes. something, wasn't it? This is the tricky thing. To an extent, it's kind of like a vanity project. This money is needed to back the Saudi leader's vision 2030, which is the slightly grandiose vision of how Saudi's going to diversify its economy away from oil. And he set this target of the company being worth $2 trillion. The um, oil company. The oil company on the markets when it listed. Now, originally, they wanted to sell 5% of the company and also a 20th of the company to the international markets. So basically, you know, we could have bought it, kind of America would buy it, pension funds, etc., etc. But while people are interested in buying this, because it's obviously it's a massive oil company, biggest oil company in the world, they weren't willing to pay the price that he wanted to fetch for it. So... What he did instead was they decided to sell just 1.5% of the company and rather than try and sell it to international investors, they sold it all to local investors in Saudi Arabia. And of course, whenever you've got a history of locking billionaires up in luxury (laughs) hotels, it's quite easy to raise that money if you're just twisting the arms of the locals. And so raising $25 billion worth for 1.5% of the company means that you get to a higher overall valuation that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what it would fetch. So the the implication of what you're saying is, had they actually continued to try to realise the remaining 3.5% of the value that they put, the value of the company would be worth less, not more? It would be worth less. I mean, don't get me wrong, it would still probably be the biggest company in the world. And the wider markets thought it would be worth maybe $1.2 trillion. But obviously that's about half of what they wanted to get for it. And so, yeah, the move was to slim down the IPO and also to sell it to local investors who'd be much more supportive for lots of reasons. I mean, Felicity, just in pure PR terms, taking the sort of financial stuff away from this for a moment, if the Saudi government are trying to tell the world that they're moving on from oil, that's what Vision 2030 is all about, diversifying their economy, doesn't it just look bad then that they've just created the world's biggest company, bigger than Apple, for their oil? On those conflicting messages. Yes, to a certain degree, but I think it is baby steps. And I think what is also very revealing about this story is it's a PR image of MBS and Saudi Arabia off the back of some really horrendous stories, such as the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. So, and I also think all the, you know, the human rights abuses, I think this is an overall sort of holistic trying to kind of whitewash, clean up their image to attract back 
foreign interests, foreign investors, whether it's economic or political or whatever. They want but, to... but it doesn't. It doesn't clean up their image because it shows how dependent on oil they are. And the world still is. That's my but, point. But I think Vision 2030, I mean, there's also this talk of Neom, isn't there? They want to, which a $500 billion futuristic mega city that would be 33 times the size of New York City. And I think they, they want to eventually get to a place where they can move the conversation away from oil and onto renewables. So I think that's a part of it. But I think this is a component to, to get them there. I don't know if you've noticed, James, the adverts that have been playing for Saudi Arabia on the X Factor and stuff and big kind of colour spreads in the newspapers telling us to all go there as tourists. Do you think that's going to work? I won't be rushing there. But then you have to consider that they're doing so much PR, like you say. I mean, even this Anthony Joshua um, fight mm. this week and everything that was in Riyadh, I think, yeah, of course, they're doing a massive PR campaign. They've got to because they're one of the most famous human rights uh, offenders in the world, which doesn't really stop our government having a lot of dealings with them, but might stop people feeling comfortable about going there. You'd certainly hope so with stuff like the Khashoggi murder and obviously what's going on in Yemen. You don't really want to be going telling all your mates I'm going to Saudi Arabia. It's not something that inspires that much confidence. But it is working, isn't it? Because it was last year that they had the Davos in the Desert summit, which was boycotted. And this year, it seems that foreign investment is returning. So I mean, international investment is clearly quite capable of turning a blind eye when it suits them. But also, John, why do they need to raise money from an IPO to be able to do this now? If the oil is so profitable, and that's why Saudi Arabia has all the money, why are they doing this at all? Don't they have enough in their coffers? Part of the big problem is they don't have enough in their coffers. Um, Two massive things have changed. Um, And the Saudis have always been aware that they're too dependent on oil. Something like 90% of their export revenue comes from oil and 90% of their budget is dependent on oil. And one thing that they've done is they've compensated for the lack of skills amongst the population by essentially building a massive welfare state that's kind of funded by paying people lots of money for civil service jobs that involve doing nothing. And that basically keeps the fairly young male population off the streets. And certainly the Arab Spring was a kind of big wake-up call to the kind of unrest that they could end up getting. The two main things are that the electric cars are on their way, and as soon as that happens, one massive bit of demand for oil is going to collapse because nobody will need petrol anymore. And the other really important geopolitical thing is that the US is no longer dependent on Saudi Arabia for oil because the US is now the world's biggest oil producer. The fact that they're selling the the, you know, the stake in the company now suggests that they think oil might not be as useful or viable in the future. Do you think that this indicates that the world's consumption of oil is really going down? Actually, it's a Saudi oil minister from a long time ago said that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. And they've always been aware that at one point, you know, the oil is no longer going to be worth anything because we'll find something better. And so, yes, I mean, I think this has just been something they've they've always worried about. And it has probably arguably accelerated, uh, particularly this year. We've seen a lot of things, uh, obviously there's Greta Thunberg, but there's also an awful lot of pressure on the asset management industry to come out of oil companies. And a lot of people are talking about the, the oil on the ground as being what they call a stranded asset. And that just means that it's something that because of climate change and because of rules governing climate change, um, and kind of introduced by governments, oil companies will no longer be able to get that oil out, even if they want to and even if it's worth something. So, yeah, I think there's definitely an element of that to this. And yet so many environmental groups have criticised this listing and saying it's the, the biggest single infusion of capital into the fossil fuel industry since the Paris Climate Accord in 2015. So. Well, that's it. You've got to, if you're investing in it, yeah. you're, you'd think you'd want to propagate it, you'd want to return. And also, especially in the market they're in, where the investors are Muslim, I wonder as well whether, because it's a bit vague, isn't it, about whether or not it's halal to invest in stocks and shares at all. And, you know, the get-out clause is, well, you're just you're just supporting a business. You know, it's not gambling. But, I mean, I know there's nothing in the Quran about don't use fossil fuels. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're clearly doing damage to the planet, you could see that some scholars might start saying, well, that's not a halal investment anyway. I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert in religion apart from... What? <laughs> apart from knowing that most religions are able to find loopholes where they need them. <laughs> um, I say that as a former Catholic. Uh, so I don't think that the religious angle really is a big issue here. Um, and yeah, I mean, you're right. I, mean, I suppose all I would point out, though, is that they were unable to list it internationally, partly because, you know, a lot of, you know, ethical investors wouldn't pick up this company and obviously so again you've got the captive audience kind of point and do you think that means that foreign investors are more ethical than a lot of western governments 
Uh, no, I think they're just self-interested. It basically boils down to, here's a good example, like most European countries have said we're going to ban petrol and diesel cars from 2040 or even 2030 in some cases. What does that say about the future for oil? It says it's pretty bleak. So if you are, and also, what do the people that you're trying to sell your funds like the look of? Because, I mean, let me put this bluntly, lots of people just buy ethical funds because they struggle with the whole idea of investment in the first place. They're very uncomfortable talking about money, and not just in this country, in most countries. Um, and the idea of the stock market looks to a lot of people like a gamble, and there seems to be something that's you know, slightly distasteful about it. So if you come along to someone and say, oh, well, why don't you invest ethically? Then you can just delegate all of that thinking, stick your money in the ethical fund, and you feel as if you're, you're doing some good. So basically, it's an easy way to flog funds. And Aramco is an easy one to not have in your fund because most funds can't own it. Um, so no, I, sorry, I'm quite cynical. but Felicity, you're up next <laughs> after this. Felicity, what do you think this week will be remembered for? This is the week we learnt that the privilege is strong with Daisy Ridley. This will be the final word in the story of Skywalker. Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. Get tickets now. There's a trailer for the new Star Wars film The Rise of Skywalker, as the voiceover man said. Um, <laughs> thankfully, Felicity, we're not here to talk about that particular movie franchise because no. I comprehend nothing about it. Um, what are we here to talk about? We're here to talk about Daisy Ridley. Who, and she's um, in it. She's in it. Yeah. Um, I literally don't know who she is because don't watch Star Wars. <laughs> um, she has given an interview to The Guardian magazine in which she was asked about her privilege and her celebrity and whether her background has been easier for her to navigate her fame and you know has been advantageous to her and her response I've got it in front of me she was incredulous by this line of questioning she said the privilege I have how no genuinely how and then she was asked about her wealth and her class and her education she went to boarding school and her grandfather was John Ridley OBE who was head of engineering the BBC his brother was a dad's army actor. So all this was put to her and she um, replied by sort of saying she thought there was very little difference between her experience and that of her co-star John Boyega, who grew up in South London to British Nigerian immigrant parents on a council estate. And she said, I think me and him are similar enough that no. And then, yeah, she sort of sort of bumbled her way through it. And basically the response on Twitter has been not very friendly. It's been pretty hostile, actually. People saying that she's tone deaf. I mean, I know Twitter has a tendency to concentrate and amplify vitriol, but it's been pretty brutal saying that she's completely tone deaf, that she has never, ever really thought about how her so-called privilege has got her to where she is. OK, so there are two strands of this, it seems to me. Mm. One, that she was asked the question in the first place, because mm, yeah. that's quite a new and noteworthy thing to discuss, isn't it? If you zoom out far enough. And second, her reaction to the question, which appears to be that she simply wasn't expecting to be asked about it and genuinely hadn't thought about it before. Yeah. And I think I think to me, that was most astonishing is that she clearly didn't see the question coming. And when it was put to her, she completely freaked out. She was so astonished that she was being asked about that. And I think that's that's very revealing that she has never really sort of meditated on that. I think there's a more generous interpretation that actually the interviewer was kind of saying, is there a correlation between her privilege and life and her b- being more confident or being more able to navigate certain social environments? And I think, to be fair, that's tricky because I think just because you come from a very wealthy background, it doesn't necessarily mean that you would be hyper confident and, and immediately get on in life. And actually, just to be fair to Ridley, she does end off this section of the interview by saying, I'm not saying what you're saying is wrong. I've just never been asked that before. So I'm like, oh, I don't think so. It's interesting to me, James, because it seems to me if she'd been to Cheltenham Ladies College and then to Oxford, she probably would have prepped an answer on that because she'd know that people would perceive her as coming from privilege. But because she went to, uh, it was a boarding school, wasn't it? But it was a boarding school for the performing arts and she went there on a grant. And because she came from a moneyed family, but not super money, they live in West London, da 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 She's justified it in her head, obviously, as... My privilege is nothing special, nothing to write home about. Do you think it's right that the journalist did ask her and were you surprised that she didn't have a response? 
I think it's right that the question was asked. I think it is the most surprising thing here, or, or the story certainly in terms of Daisy Ridley, is just that she hadn't considered it. And I think that's the really surprising bit, that she'd managed to get to 27 years of age without considering her privilege in the context. I mean, I don't know how you can follow the general election campaign even and not think a bit about privilege or about how people's education and things influences their chances in life. That's the surprising bit, that she didn't consider it, especially... This isn't the first time this kind of thing has come up. Obviously, we know that 42%, I think, of BAFTA uh, winners went to private schools. Many of our most famous actors all went to school together or you know went to school with the prime minister or something like that. So it's not necessarily a new thing, which is why it's even more surprising that she was surprised. I suppose she's thinking, well, I'm not privileged. It's the P word itself, isn't it? I'm not privileged because I was working in a bar when I got my job in Star Wars. And so she thinks, you know, she didn't swan in and get the job. Other people think, well, you only had the life of an out-of-work actor, you know, supplanting your income by working at a bar because you didn't have to think when you were 19, how the hell am I going to make any money for the rest of my life? The only reason I'm surprised she hadn't thought about it was more that I'm amazed at her PR people. I mean, Star Wars is pretty ruthless with its PR stuff, so I would have thought somebody would have said to her, look, you know, there's a lot of stuff about privilege in the papers just now. Maybe you should have a think about it. Here's what you should say. Here's what you might want to say. Um, and is it right that every PR person who represents someone who went to a private school, basically, should be having that conversation so that they have an answer to that question? I hate to say, but yes. I mean, that's what PR people are for. I mean, I think the whole thing, I hate to say, I think it's stupid, especially when it comes to something like acting. I mean, I don't care about the background of my actors. I mean, I care more about the background of my politicians, about the background of my lawyers, about the background of the judges, about the background of the journalists. I think it, I think it is really important, actually. I can see where you're coming from, but I do think that the problem at the moment, especially in terms of uh, British acting, is that you're seeing far and far more shows being made, such as Downton Abbey, that I think really um, plays into the hands of these actors who went to private educated schools. And I think that's worrying because I think it means that you're seeing fewer and fewer working class actors. And not only that, but fewer and fewer dramas and plays about working class life. And I think that's really dangerous because I think what you can glean or learn from the state of British society can be reflected in the in the culture we watch. And if it is just Eddie Redmayne and Tom Hiddlestone and Daisy Ridley, I think that's really, really sad. And I, I think with The the Crown was really interesting because... Um, it cast privately educated actors for the Queen, Prince Philip, Princess Margaret and Prince Charles. And the notable exception was Erin Doherty, who plays Princess Anne. She said she spent most of her childhood happily hanging around in Croydon wearing a tracksuit. But I think it's very, very interesting. And it was the same with Jodie Comer, who came from a working class northern background. And she herself was plagued by self-doubts about whether she was in the right industry or whether she'd ever make it because she just simply didn't think she'd fit. And I think that's really sad and I think it is important. But that's to do, isn't it, as well with the creators behind the scene? I think it's probably to do with casting I think it's more likely that you A you just have a bigger concentration to, to begin with of privately educated actors to choose from but B you're probably more likely to go for them and overlook if there are any working class actors for these roles This is it's interesting because as Felicity was saying what we watch on TV or whatever is a mirror kind of to what our society is like but it's not an, it, a siloed thing this is just representative of the kind of desirable industries as a whole in the country. So you've got everything from um, senior civil servants, senior judges, diplomats, journalists, you know, even sports players. They all often have more privileged backgrounds. So I think that this is just another thing where people who have privilege just basically have more time to work on what they want to do. And I think that's that's an interesting thing because it's not just about having the money, it's having the kind of security that, you know, actually, if I'm out of work, writer or actor for 10 years, it doesn't matter because eventually I'll get my break. I've got time to wait. Going back to the article, though, and this business about why she wasn't able to recognise her own privilege. I mean, whether or not you're an actor, that's something that it seems to me that you might think about anyway. Anyone listening to this might think about whether or not the things that happened to them in their life and or the way that they were born has affected their life. Yeah, I agree. I think it is about a sort of basic level of self-awareness. And I think that's why people have got very, very upset about her comments. I think maybe she is interpreting it in a hostile way Mm. because it's almost maybe she thinks it's some sort of slight on her acting ability or her talent as Mm. if this and it doesn't at all as if this how she grew up sort of detracts from that which it you know it doesn't you can go along and watch the film and you wouldn't necessarily know her background and you judge for yourself on her merits whether she's a good actor or not and I actually I find 
I mean, she did it in a very ham-fisted and clumsy way, but comparing herself to John Boyega, again, a generous inter- interpretation. I think maybe she wants to kind of make the point that talent supersedes any questions of where you come from. Like, she and John obviously have a great working relationship. They're in the same film. They both got there. And I think maybe she's trying to express her kind of, like, kinship and the fact that they get on so well. Well, she's trying to say the of casting like of Star Wars is meritocracy. Look who my co-star is. But, I mean, the point is that she was in a position where she was able to act mm. because of her That's true. her route. Obviously it's about networks too and it's about the people that you went to school with and if you know someone who is casting or who's written something and you can get a small part in, in you know their movie or their short or whatever then that helps you obviously because it means that you get those early legs up that you need, you get credits um, yeah, you know, things for your show reel. I do find it fascinating that you guys all think that this is something that she should have considered because I mean, if you think about it, I mean Five years ago, nobody would have been asked this question. It also, with the best one in the world, it does seem to be women that cop a lot more flack for this. I mean, Phoebe Waller-Bridges kind of got called out for Fleabag, when in fact she's an exceptionally competent writer. And it's the same way, you know, other kind of women that stand out this way. Whereas, I mean, I know that Benedict Cumberbatch gets slagged off for it occasionally, but there's not this same level of... Oh, you're, you know, you're not owning your privilege, you're not. So I don't know, I also think there is a tiny wee bit of kind of sexism involved in, in this particular case. Yeah, I think that's completely right. I think with Phoebe Waller-Bridge and Fleabag, it was, it was an intro, I think it was a, an article saying that this is in no way representative of all women everywhere. It's one woman's you know, middle class story. And it's like, well, yeah, but she never said that she was trying to represent all women everywhere. But just because of that, she still gets to have a voice and be applauded for her talent and her creativity. I completely agree with John. I think there are double standards at play. Surprise, surprise. Okay, one last story to come after this. Okay, finally, James, it's your turn. What do you think this week will be remembered for? Why psychopaths are just misunderstood. The problem with psychopaths, psychologists say, is that they're everywhere. Some say one in every hundred of us is a psychopath. They aren't all in jail or in mental health facilities. You probably passed one on the street today. And it's not like you can tell who they are. Their verbal and non-verbal clues are invisible to unsuspecting civilians. Many are very high-functioning people who excel in politics and business. The distinctive tones of John Ronson promoting his book The Psychopath Test on the Riverhead Books YouTube channel a couple of years back. James, what has happened this week? Well, a new study has come out which basically suggests that individuals with psychopathic traits are not actually impaired in their ability to empathise as previously thought. They just don't particularly want to empathise. Yeah, because if you define a psychopath, that's one of the things you immediately reach for, isn't it? They cannot understand life beyond their own world. Is that confusion with narcissism then? I think narcissism is a crucial component of psychopathy, but the thing that kind of made the difference was always that psychopaths didn't have empathy, so they couldn't relate to other people, they didn't care about other people. But this now suggests that actually they kind of have a switch, so they can, the reason that this can be so charming and things is actually because they can empathise, so they can put themselves in the shoes of other people and actually say, oh yeah, I kind of know what you're feeling, and that enables them to do more of their naughty psychopath stuff, which is taking advantage of them. And so what's the science that's actually been uh, written up this week? It actually came from an online survey of HR professionals, so they were kind of given <laughs> <laughs> Which, come on. Unexpected sentence. Come on. <laughs> um, yeah, they, I think they were, they were given questions through something on LinkedIn where it was basically they had to respond to statements about how much they cared about other people and stuff like that, which you'd hope for HR directors they cared about other people a little bit. But it turned out that the people who really didn't care about others that much were also the ones who displayed other traits associated with, with psychopathy. Mm, okay, so we don't know that those people were psychopaths well, then. we don't know that they we were psychopaths. We just know they're HR professionals, which, which, crucially to any HR professionals listening, isn't the same thing. It's not the same thing. <laughs> but no, there, I, mean, there were, I think it's been backed up in science previously. So there was a survey um, a couple of years ago that looked at it from a much more clinical point of view. So they put th- people through an MRI scanner and they did things like whacking them with rulers and stuff and whacking other people with rulers and worked out that the psychopaths did have this ability to turn on and off their empathy, which was quite interesting. Well, I saw that. That was back in 2013. And what the study seemed to show then was it was a brain scan. And they could see that when they were shown people in pain or whatever, that the psychopaths' brains did respond like someone with empathy might. 
but that didn't affect their behaviour. But that might imply something they can't control. You know, just because their brains understand it doesn't mean they're choosing not to do it. Whereas this study says people are choosing not to empathise. So what do we learn from that? I think if you take the study at face value and if you accept that that's true, that the psychopaths are choosing not to empathise, then you actually have to say maybe they're even worse than before because if they didn't have empathy and they couldn't understand people and that's why they were doing these awful things, then maybe you kind of say, oh, well, you're not really that responsible. But now if you're saying, no, you do understand what you're doing to other people, you do understand the pain that you're causing, etc., but you still want to do it, it kind of doesn't reflect well on the psychopaths. OK, well, James has got the Mail Online version there, Felicity. Psychopaths <laughs> worse than before. <laughs> might it actually tell us that we might understand a bit more about why psychopaths behave the way they do and help? Yeah, I think so. And I think every study that is done into psychopaths and how they respond in situations is a step, a much needed step into understanding what's going on and a sort of buttress against ridiculous characters you get in in culture that we all know so well. I mean, the number of articles when I was researching this that came illustrated with Christian Bale in American Psycho Mm. goes to show that this is like intention grabbing stuff and you kind of really got to dig down before you get to anything that means something, I suppose. But I think the main thing that comes up time and time again is that not all psychopaths are the same. It's, I think there is that sort of very binary, simplistic uh, interpretation of the psychopaths are all over there and we're all over here. And actually, it's far more the case that there's a spectrum. Mm. It's the same with lots of conditions like autism. Well, you know, you can be on it. And I think, as previously alluded to, we are all sort of on the spectrum somewhere. So I think sweeping generalizations is really problematic. And I think a lot of these studies are quite problematic. I think even this one that James has has brought to this discussion, it it rested on a very, very small sample. And it was a lot of self-reported questionnaire items. So that there is that kind of concern that, you know, it's how you want to present yourself. And can you sort of game the system to appear how you want to appear? I think it does raise interesting questions about whether you can be a good psychopath. We all immediately think of psychopaths as being violent serial killers and criminals. Mm. And actually, there's been really interesting research that says probably a lot of um, special forces troops like the British Special Air Service or Navy SEALs um, or even surgeons who have to be absolutely ruthless and not really show any empathy and start, you know, operating in extreme circumstances. You probably want those guys to be psychopaths. So maybe at some point we need to get to a stage where it becomes sort of a compliment to be a psycho. That's a really interesting (laughs) way of putting it. I interviewed a couple of surgeons recently, John, and they were talking about how obviously the phrase they didn't use was psychopath. They didn't self-identify that way, but they they did talk about how you have to be more sort of man than machine was the phrase that they use so that you can go and meet the patients you're about to operate on and have a, a conversation with them and relate to them as, as human beings that's important but actually yes they then flick the switch when they're in the operating theater because they need to make calm decisions under pressure like ai not like a person who thinks oh that's someone's mum one of the problems with all of these psychological studies and experiments is a lot of times it's like, well, hey, what are you actually measuring and what is the, the point it's useful to understand psychopathy if psychopaths are people who go out and serially murder people, it's not actually that useful if it's just some sort of vague term that refers to people who are able to be tough-minded in difficult situations. I mean, I think that's the other thing. I mean, I wouldn't describe anyone, like a surgeon, for example, as being a psychopath. It just happens to be that they know what they have to do in a particular job, and that's what you need to do get on with it. I mean, there have been studies that have shown that psychopaths can be quite good for society because in these morally dubious situations they can make pragmatic choices for the greater good. There was something I saw actually from the 80s. There was Home Office officials were proposing hiring psychopaths to deal with the um, the fallout from a nuclear disaster because they thought that they have no feelings for others, no, no moral code and tend to be very intelligent and logical. So I think it shows that maybe there can be a place for psychopaths to do good if they can just get over the murdery bit. So the question is how can we help people get over the murdery bit or to use more scientific words how could we encourage them to turn that switch on? Well, I think that studies like this one, which suggests that psychopaths do have the ability to empathise, mean that therapists now have something to work with. So there is a way in there, because if you can relate to someone, that's a good way to start treating them through things like therapy. Yeah, but aren't we into then sort of minority report area? Like, OK, you're treating someone with therapy, but if they haven't done anything, you're just saying you've got the profile of someone who could be a psychopath, so we need to intervene. Authorities have to become aware of these people in order for you to start treating them. And I think that that can happen through things like the criminal justice system. 1% of the population um, are psychopaths, as John Ronson was saying in this clip, whereas there's, I think, 15% of prisoners are psychopaths. So I think that that's a good way um, to kind of identify people and then maybe start treating them. Also, I think apparently CEOs and kind of senior management, between 4 and 15% of them are 
apparently considered psychopaths. So maybe you need to start looking at CEOs and kind of treating them. And John's nodding vigorously with this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's often been studies saying, you know, is your boss a psychopath? And, you know, there's something in the Telegraph about one in five CEOs were psychopaths. And obviously there's a big bit in John Ronson's book about it uh, where he kind of singles out one specific guy who was a very much a kind of slash and burn kind of CEO. Then it was associated with the idea that you go in, take over a company, brutally make lots of people redundant. Um, and there's always that sense that the market actually likes that because you get rid of loads of people, you immediately boost your profits over the short term. I mean, again, I think the problem is that it boils down to this thing of what are we actually searching for here? What is the trait that we're searching for? And also, I can see a lot of this stuff, you know, psychology is undergoing a massive replication crisis just now, which is that, you know, a lot of studies that have historically been accepted are now being overturned because they can't be replicated by other people. And I suspect that a lot of this psychopathy stuff will end up being found to be exaggerated or badly kind of put together. Um, so, yeah, I, honestly, I think an awful lot it comes down to, look, actually, what, what are you trying to find out here? <laughs> and also, is it actually possible? I mean, all it's all about the brain, which has to be the most complex, most misunderstood organ that we have, that we don't really know what it's doing a lot of the time. So, yeah. uh, again, I go back to my early point that I think in some ways, every study we do is both helping us and also probably taking us back a few steps, sort of one step forward, two steps back, because you can't really tell how much the study is really, really telling us. The samples are never really that accurate. But at the same time, it's quite clear that so much more work needs to be done on um, just to add fuel to that fire, I found an online test from psychcentral.com to see if any of us might be psychopaths. So let's do this. Uh, obviously, this isn't diagnostic, but uh, we're going to see how common these traits are. And let's start with you, Felicity. How likely are you to agree with the following statement? If something goes wrong or turns out badly, it's not my fault. 100%. <laughs> no, it's true. It's never my fault. It's, right. it's bizarre. Mm-hmm. John, live in the moment is what I say. The future will take care of itself and learning from your past is pointless. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> You know me. <laughs> I, I, I know you're joking, but this last one I could imagine. I mean, I'm a radio presenter, so maybe all presenters might agree with this. I can turn my charm on and off like a faucet. Are you putting that to me? I'm, I'm saying, well, yeah. Do you agree with that, James? No, it's always on. It's always on. <laughs> yeah. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Because, like, I'm not saying everyone finds me charming at all, but I'm saying, like, part of my job is being able to do that. And that's something apparently psychopaths agree with. There's that grandiose sense of self worth coming through. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, that is it from this edition of The Week Unwrapped. Thank you very much to our team this week, Felicity Capon, John Stepek and James Ashford. Don't forget to subscribe to The Week Unwrapped on your podcast app of choice and do leave us positive reviews about our levels of relatability and willingness to empathise. I've been Ollie Mann, our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Sarah Miles at Rethink Audio. Until we meet again to unwrap next week, bye-bye.